All systems are go and we are ready to lift off. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another timeless episode of Ikuza Unscripted Podcast. Not because of us, but because of our guest. We have the honor to welcome our first Nobel laureate to the show. He won a Nobel in physics for his work on the Cosmic uh, Background Explorer satellite with George Smoot. And he was among uh, Time's uh, magazine top 100 most influential people in the world. And also James Webb Project Director, Dr. John Cromwell Mather. Doctor, are you ready to go genuine, uncensored and unscripted? with us today and share the secrets and the beauty of the universe with our fans. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, they won't be secret anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, nice. love, I love the attitude. To begin with, uh, let me ask you, uh, before we start unveiling the universe story, what's your story, Doctor? How did, you, how did the boy from Roanoke, Virginia, grow up into the man who is one of the leaders of the new era uh, in space exploration? Oh, my goodness. A long story. Um, my father was a scientist uh, working on dairy cows, and that was his first job uh, working for Virginia Tech in, uh, in Virginia. Uh, when I was about one year old, I persuaded my parents to move to New Jersey uh, to a different farm, a uh, research farm for Rutgers University. So I got my start uh, living in the countryside, uh, reading books from the bookmobile and thinking about the marvels of science and looking at the sky and thinking about the stars and uh, especially uh, got my attention this uh, giant meteorite that sits by the planetarium in New York City. So I uh, went to public schools and I went off to college and graduate school. And in graduate school, I have a chance to work on a thesis to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation from the Big Bang. So <clears throat> that project actually failed to function properly. Uh, for my thesis, so I had to write a thesis about a thing that did not work. <clears throat> but a few months later, I had a job in uh, New York City working for NASA, and NASA said, we'd like proposals for new satellites. So that was just five years after the first Apollo landing. Uh, mm, NASA yeah. to move. So, okay, so now is, what is NASA going to do? Let's try some science. So I told my boss, well, my thesis project failed, but we should try it in outer space. He said, we'll write a proposal. <laughs> We'll write a proposal, and so we called up our friends and we sent in the proposal. And I thought, well, that'll never work, uh, but it did work. So a couple of years later, NASA said we would start a study of this mission, and that's turned out into the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite that really did measure the Big Bang. Uh, we measured the color of the original material, um, and it turns out to be colorless. That is to say, it fits a simple formula exactly, of what we call a black body function. Uh, mm -hmm. So it confirms that the cosmic microwave radiation really is the remnant of the very earliest times of the universe. Uh, then a couple of years later, we measured that there are hot and cold spots in the map of the radiation. Uh, and that was a very, very important uh, discovery because it now explains why we exist. Uh, the early universe was not exactly uniform. Uh, there mm -hmm. were hot, the hot and cold spots mean density variations as well. So it uh, tells us that uh, there were spots which were just a little more dense than the average place. And uh, the gravity operating on the material in those particular areas was enough to stop the expansion of the material and pull it back to make galaxies and stars and eventually planets. And we're here because of that. So um, that's pretty important to us. And that's. Uh, eventually was confirmed by two more satellite missions. And that's how come I got to go to Stockholm with George Smoot. And yeah, when yeah. that was all done, I thought, well, now what am I going to do? Uh, there's nothing so exciting I can imagine yet. Um, so, but uh, I was just sitting around thinking what to do. And I got a call from NASA headquarters. We do like to work on this new telescope that we're starting to think about. So I said, absolutely, yes, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, and we were hoping that it would be a little bit quicker than it is, but uh, that was 27 years ago now. So uh, I've been working on it ever since. Mm, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's crazy. But uh, uh, let me ask you this right now. You, uh, you mentioned how you didn't know what to do after uh, the Swedes called, obviously. I, I believe that winning a Nobel Prize is something of, of the greatest honor, in, in, especially in your profession, but, you know, in 
possibly any anyone winning the Nobel Prize. So uh, was your mindset at the time, you know, uh, I'm just going to wait, like you waited till they called you or were you like, uh, did, did you have some, something in mind? Let's go even bigger. What was my future for, for the science and the yeah. me in it? Okay, well, stepping back to 1995, when I got that phone call from headquarters, uh, that was before the, the uh, phone call from Stockholm. So yeah. in 1995, I was thinking, what new telescope to build? I was working with Chuck Bennett on proposing the, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, which did go on to great success and measured the Big Bang even better. Um, but my friends were saying, well, you know, um, the Spitzer Space Telescope is gonna, going to go up soon, and it's not big enough. Mm. So I started saying, well, in that case, if it's not big enough, what do we do? Um, about a telescope that unfolds in outer space. Mm. So I was already thinking about that before uh, the phone call came to let's start building something. Uh, now, my idea wasn't going anywhere because it wasn't time yet. Uh, uh, yeah. But in 1995, you know, we had just repaired the Hubble Space Telescope and we were starting to get wonderful pictures and data from the Hubble. And the, and the results from the Hubble told us why we needed to build a new telescope. Yeah. So yeah. number one, um, the, the most exciting thing at the time was that Hubble was discovering the most distant galaxies we had ever seen. We took a picture called the Hubble Deep Field, and we pointed the telescope in an empty place in the sky for two weeks. Mm, yeah. And it was, the picture was just covered with galaxies. Yeah. So the uh, result was... Um, Astronomers were surprised. We <laughs> thought when we designed the Hubble that we would be able to see the very first galaxies growing. Uh, and the answer was, no, you can't. Uh, the Hubble is not the right tool. It mm -hmm. needs to be bigger and it needs to be able to see farther back in time and farther out in space, which means uh, you need to have an infrared telescope to pick up the light that was ultraviolet when it was emitted. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, build an infrared telescope that's even bigger than Webb, than Hubble, and uh, and uh, use it for that. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, so that's how we got started in '95. And by the way, that's also when uh, astronomers were just beginning to realize that there's something called cosmic dark energy, which is making yeah. the expanding universe accelerate. And <clears throat> there are planets around most stars. We didn't quite know it yet, but we were just beginning to learn about planets that are there. And so we said, okay, uh, maybe this new telescope should be able to see planets as well. And so we, we thought about that, uh, but that's a really hard job. So we just said, we'll do the best we can. <laughs> so in a weird way, telescopes are tools for space archeology span as we use them to look into the past. And Hubble Space Telescope, it went, uh, it was revolutionary. It went, if I'm correct, uh, let me read, 13.1 <laughs> billion years into the past, or in the other words, 700 million years after the Big Bang. And James Webb has the ability and even more serious task to go beyond that, to go 100 or 200 million years after the Big Bang. And what answers can we get from peaks so far in the, in the past? Oh, well, we hope to see what were the physical processes that controlled everything. Mm -hmm. So, um, we see pictures, we see little images of little galaxies, uh, uh, and we already are seeing these with the web. Uh, we're seeing um, some surprises. Uh, number one, even the web telescope uh, is showing us that uh, galaxies grew much more quickly, uh, much brighter, and much hotter than we were expecting based on what we knew before. So we don't yet know what is the reason for this, but we know this is what we're seeing. So in a, in a little while, I'm sure astronomers will have a better opinion about why this is. Uh, we might have missed something about the basic I physics that governs the formation of galaxies. Because from the COBE and WMAP and Planck missions, we do have uh, measurements of the initial conditions of the universe when it was about 400,000 years old. And then um, we think we should be able to calculate how the galaxies grow. Um, mm -hmm. But we wow. seem not to be getting it right yet. So uh, <laughs> this is important. So let me, um, that's a big surprise. Yeah, let, let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, one of the things uh, I read about four science mandates of James Webb. And one that interests me particularly is uh, planets and origins of life. And I was thinking, uh, do we know the answer 
is life something that nature strives to create uh, end goal is life almost or is life something that happens at least the way we perceive life as almost a coincidence almost something that you know can happen but might not good question well of course we don't know the answer to your question mm -hmm. um, because we only have one observational data point which is earth yeah. Um, so what, what the geologists are telling us from the fossil record is that uh, within a few hundred million years of the formation of the oceans, um, there are signs of fossil life. So that suggests that whatever it was, it was quick. Mm. And if it was quick, then maybe it's not unusual. Maybe it's even what I call a thermodynamic imperative, something that would always happen if the conditions are good. So this is a different idea from what people used to think, because uh, uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, people looked at the complexity of life and they couldn't imagine how all that complexity could arise um, from the forces of nature. Um, but now I think we are driven to consider the possibility that it's a thermodynamic imperative that will always happen uh, whenever it's given a chance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't know, uh, but we have one observation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, recently was discovered Toy 700D, uh, the labeled as the in the habitable so zone. What does the term actually mean to have the planet in a habitable zone? Is it uh, the conditions to life to exist? By, like look at said, what are the chances of forms actually existing there? Can we ever, in our lifetime, have a means to confirm life existing there? Uh, good, good question. Well, well, what's the term mean? Habitable zone means uh, uh, planets of about the right size and temperature uh, mm -hmm. to be like Earth. So not, if they're too big, then they will not have a uh, solid surface. They'll be more like Neptune or even mm -hmm. Jupiter. Uh, so mm -hmm. They'll be a gaseous planet. Um, if they're too cold, um, then they can't really support liquid water. Uh, we think or imagine that liquid water is necessary for the for life because that's where we find it here. Yeah. Um, so it's not we don't really know that, but it's a good place to look. Mm. So um, that's that's why we call it the habitable zone, the right size and temperature. Uh, the next question is, well, what sort of star should we be looking around? So um, we have stars like the sun. The sun is uh, pretty big, pretty bright, and uh, Earth is pretty far away from it, uh, 93 million miles, so 150,000 million kilometers. Um, and uh, the sun is peaceful most of the time. We have It has solar storms, uh, which we mm -hmm. see here on Earth when we get an aurora. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But um, actually uh, observing a, an Earth-like planet around the star like the sun is quite difficult uh, because uh, the sun is 10 billion times brighter than the Earth. Mm. So that's a huge problem. You, you can't just build a telescope to see a little faint thing next to a very bright thing. It's very hard. Mm -hmm. So the other technique that we have is called transit spectroscopy. So um, if you're fortunate uh, and you know when to look, a planet can go in front of its star and block yeah, some of the starlight. Right. And so um, then you can analyze to see um, whether you can see any sign of an atmosphere. Uh, mm -hmm. Does any of the starlight go through the planet's atmosphere on its way to our telescope? And so uh, we know this technique works. Uh, we have studied some very large, bright planets, very hot planets this way, and we have even been able to measure what the chemicals are in the atmosphere. There's one where we recently measured it has sodium and potassium atoms. It has carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. It has water, even has sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. But this is a planet that's very unfriendly to ordinary life. It's very hot. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. uh, but it was an easy target. So we know we can try that. And so we will be observing altogether 62 uh, planets by this method during the first year of operation of the web. Um, so, um, well, we'll, we'll tell you when we find out something that's interesting. Uh, yeah. I'm sure it will be a great surprise if we can say uh, this is a planet like Earth that has water. That's one yeah. of the main targets. And when uh, we are talking about the life in space, we are talking about carbon-based life. Am I right? But uh, yes. What what are the odds to have 
life based on something other, for example? <laughs> well, uh, chemists argue about this, but it's pretty clear that carbon is a better atom than most others. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. uh, carbon uh, makes uh, chains and a very complex chemistry, and the other ones don't uh, without a lot of extra help. So uh, chemists can synthesize the most astonishing things, uh, but nature synthesizes things out of carbon mostly. So you could say, well, is that the only way? Um, well, another thing that could be different would be the solvent. You know, we use water. Everything here that's alive is in water. Um, but um, what if that's not the only solvent, the only mm -hmm. liquid? So there's uh, one interesting laboratory here in the solar system, the satellite Titan, which orbit, orbits around Saturn. Mm -hmm. It's uh, big enough to have its own atmosphere. Uh, it's cold enough so that methane and ethane are liquids on the surface. Mm -hmm. So Titan has weather, it has rain, it has clouds, it has lakes and rivers of methane and ethane. So if you could imagine uh, that this is a good place to live, then, uh, then that's a place to look. Uh, does the, is there any sign of life on Titan? So not yet, uh, but we will be sending a probe to land on the surface of Titan in about 2036, I think. Oh, so soon. Coming soon. Yeah. <laughs> coming soon. We're building it now, and it will have a helicopter a little quadcopter to go from place to place to see what can it see. Now, this is only the first reconnaissance, so I won't expect to see signs of life this time, but mm -hmm. we'll be taking pictures and asking the question. Yeah, I bet the cockroaches will be able to find a way to somehow survive. They are very resourceful. Yeah, <laughs> but let me ask you this. Uh, uh, now you mentioned all those things and things that James Webb can tell us and, uh, you know, that we're yet to discover. But, uh, I remember when the first pictures were made available to the public and the social media was taken by them, you know, everybody was posting them. Still is. Yeah, still is. And I remember I was like, uh, first time I saw them, I was like, this is fake. This is somebody made a very good Photoshop. This is not legit. Uh, what... But to you, who saw the, the pictures of earlier telescopes, earlier satellites, what was the feeling like to you, uh, the, the, the evolution that you saw in the science technology that we, that we achieved? Yes. Uh, well, I guess number one is uh, we proved that the telescope works beautifully. Uh, yeah. So that was the first thing. Uh, without any image processing, we just take a picture of one place in the sky and with one filter just to know that the telescope is focused correctly. And so it was a great excitement the day that we saw that because not only was the star in perfect focus, but there were galaxies everywhere. <laughs> and so we knew, okay, this is gonna be beautiful. Uh, then when we get uh, more data, we can take pictures in more than one color uh, and uh, create a color image. Then it's even more beautiful to look at. Yeah. Um, then um, I think we were all surprised at how beautiful the pictures really are because nobody could tell us in advance what we should see. We yeah. just knew we had the numbers about the performance of the telescope. And we had no way to really imagine the appearance of those, uh, uh, especially the clouds of dust and gas where stars are being born today. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's Serena uh, Nebula. The, 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 yeah, great the Eagle picture. Nebula, the pillars of creation, the yeah, cosmic cliffs, amazing. the beautiful pictures um, we could not imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm, yeah, that, that is amazing. I mean, like I'm telling you, because uh, to this day, every time that James Webb releases the picture, everybody is still in awe, and that that, that must be some some feeling <laughs> about it when you uh, you know help, uh, helped create it. Uh, but one more thing, uh, like on that subject, uh, I know that James Webb had many obviously projects big as that had many issues had setbacks you know uh, you know as i read some uh, at one point it almost uh, the funding the was cut in 2011 if i uh, believe then the pandemic uh, what was the feeling what the feeling did you have when on december 25th uh, it finally flew uh, did you felt relieved did you felt like uh, you know i i achieved something great what what, what was the feeling at the moment Oh my goodness. Well, my feeling was relief and also I was tired. 
because uh, we've been <laughs> working on this for a long time, and so has everybody else that worked on it. So um, anyway, but because of COVID, I was just watching the launch from my living room, uh, sitting on my sofa with my wife. And so uh, most of us were stayed home. We could not go to the launch parties because of COVID. Uh, wow. So, so um, anyway, we had to be very care careful because we didn't want any of our operations team that had to be working together in person with the computers to uh, expose each other to the COVID. So we were very careful uh, and we were pretty lucky. Uh, anyway, uh, we were also very fortunate that uh, nothing went wrong with the observatory. Uh, mm -hmm. You could say, well, why did nothing go wrong? Well, several things. Number one, we did what we should do to test the <laughs> observatory before we launched it. Uh, number two, um, we um, we rehearsed. We have a what I call a digital twin, a computer that simulates the operation of the real telescope. So we were able to practice sending commands and getting information back to make sure that we would know how to work the telescope. And I guess it's also important to thank our various uh, sources of funds of, from in Europe and Canada and the, and the United States. So all of the nations that contributed to the observatory, they all said, yes, we will. it is so important. We will continue to support you until you're ready to go. And so we did not ever have to say we're going to take a big chance to a failure because we didn't have enough money to do the work. So uh, it's true that we did have a problem with the budget, uh, but our politicians came through and uh, and sent the money that we all needed in all in Europe, Canada, and the United States. Mm, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, uh, so science won, basically. Yes. Well, common sense won. You can't really plan to build such a difficult observatory and then decide at the last minute you're not going to test it. Yeah, right. Yeah, but but, but uh, I imagine, like you mentioned, the people, a lot of, a lot of people that worked on it, and uh, it involved Europeans, Canadians, Americans. Uh, what was you, like, you, I must imagine you were in a, a role of a leader almost, and that you worked with many different personalities, brilliant minds. Uh, how did you manage that? Did you? Uh, uh, how was was it difficult? You know, working with all these people that maybe you didn't know from the various backgrounds, and uh, what was the leadership like for you in, in that sense? Okay, well, just one small distinction. I'm a scientist, not a manager, so yeah, yeah. I do not actually have to work with uh, managing the teams of people. You know, twenty thousand people around the world helped build the telescope. Wow! And I never met most of them. I work primarily with other scientists to decide uh, what it was that we needed to build. And I worked with engineers to make sure that's what we were building. So um, I did not have the job of uh, making sure all of these many personalities would work together correctly. Our project managers do that and they're brilliant at, the, at what they do. I cannot do what they do. I'm just in awe of the project manager's skill and, and the warmth and vision that they have to make us all work together and feel good doing it. And let me back, uh, let me get back to the galaxy part. You spoke about how many galaxies we were able to, to finally see new galaxies and all those new information about them. And there's, there was one uh, photo of, uh, where two galaxies start to merge, if I'm right. And yeah. what's, what's actually that process of merging the galaxy? It's, is it chaos destruction or is, is it, or is it a renewal process? Oh, well, many things happen when uh, two galaxies come together. Um, the stars are very small compared with the space between them, so the stars uh, do not hit each other. Uh, the uh, gaseous material uh, that you can see because it has dust grains in it um, mm -hmm. will collide with the gaseous, gaseous material in the other galaxy, and there'll be a great crash. And we call it a shock wave uh, mm. when these two uh, sets of material collide. And that sets us off all kinds of things. Uh, number one, it gets hot. Uh, number two, it cools off again afterwards. And then uh, new stars are born in that material. Mm -hmm. So um, we have, I'm not sure if this is the picture we're thinking of, but we have a, a, um, a picture of a galaxy uh, with a ring around it. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we have yeah. another galaxy uh, in the upper left corner uh, that, uh, and we know now that it actually went right through the center of the big galaxy. Mm. And so um, they, uh, 
material has been disturbed and uh, they are both of these galaxies are starting new stars to be born as we speak. So that's what happens when galaxies come together. Uh, by the way, it's in our own future too. The uh, Andromeda Nebula is coming toward yeah. us and in about two or three billion years, it will be here. And mm, so- I'm really worried about that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, well, we have different things to worry about first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because before that happens, the sun will be so bright that we can't live here on Earth. We'll need to move to Mars and maybe even farther out uh, by then. Uh, but at any rate, it will be a glorious thing to watch for whoever is here then. Um, yeah. Because uh, the, the stars will suddenly come flying through and uh, be very close to us. Mm, yeah. yeah. But you, uh, I'm glad that you're optimistic that somebody will be there to, to watch, <laughs> at least from our race. Yes, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, actually um, the way I look at it is uh, humanity is very likely to be a short lived species here because most species are. The geological yeah. record says uh, most species die out after a few million years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what comes after them will be equally interesting, um, yeah. but we don't know what it is. There's even evidence very recently that uh, the Tyrannosaurus dinosaurs were uh, very smart that their yeah. brains were yeah. large and capable. So yeah, we, uh, who knows? So, but they did not build space rockets as far as we know. Yeah, <laughs> we, except in the episode of Rick and Morty, but <laughs> we had a paleontologist here as a guest, Mark Lowen, truly, truly brilliant mind. And he spoke about dinosaurs and uh, the Tyrannosaurus uh, especially. And you should run if you see. <laughs> yeah. It's the funny thing he said, uh, we were talking about uh, the extinction of the dinosaur, and he, and he said, uh, unlike dinosaurs that saw their world crash in the second, uh, we will watch uh, destruction of our world in the slow motion yeah. uh, with the things that are going with climate change and maybe nuclears or something. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, the way I look at it, uh, I don't know our future, but I know the general future of life is is positive that uh, life seems to persist through all kinds of disasters yeah. so we've had altogether five major extinctions here on earth since the uh, appearance of complex life uh, about 550 million years ago which is itself only a very small fraction of the total history of the earth so yeah. quite frequent extinctions occur so <laughs> but that depends yeah. on your time scale <laughs> life finds a way Dr. Matter, allow me to ask you maybe the biggest questions for the most. Where are all those aliens that we are promised, uh, Dr. Matter? Where are all those aliens we hear in Joe Rogan's, uh, we hear Joe Rogan's guest speak about? Where are all those aliens and uh, George Tukulos is speaking about on ancient aliens? Uh, just kidding. <laughs> I know, I don't know why we as humans have this need to attach, to give credits for our personal achievements to gods, to aliens or some other abstract beings. But, and with that thought in mind, uh, as a scientist, uh, as a Nobel winner, do you really think there are any chances that we already made contact with uh, aliens? Well, my goodness, uh, my opinion <laughs> is uh, that uh, other planets are too far away for aliens to get here from there. Yeah. So um, it's just, when you try to think about how could we send a, a mission to another planet, uh, it's very hard to even go to the moon and Mars and yeah. uh, going to another solar system is incredibly difficult. So the way we calculate things so with the rockets that we could imagine building today, it would take 100,000 years to get to the nearest <laughs> other star. Yeah. Well, so uh, life was, whatever you start with is going to be different by the time it gets there. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I'm guessing is that it's uh, um, just really hard to imagine uh, a, a real alien civilization uh, doing that trip uh, and then not appearing to say hello. Um, yeah. <laughs> why Thank you for that. <laughs> after they're not here? Yeah, why wouldn't they come visit and say, hello, John, here I am. Can we talk? Yeah. Um, so I can't imagine uh, what, what that. Now, that's not to say there aren't mysteries in the world. Uh, there are so many things we don't explain easily. Uh, yeah. And no one really has analyzed all of them uh, because you can't. Uh, there are strange things in our equipment. There are strange, strange things in our eyesight. Um, 
there are strange things that people build. Uh, and sometimes we even have strange things in our minds. So um, I don't know what all these unexplained events are. Of course, I couldn't possibly know. Um, but I am pretty sure that it's not aliens from another planet because it's too far. It's too hard for them. So that's my guess. Mm, yeah. So we are ruling out the possibility they are far more advanced than us. <laughs> and I'm glad for that. If, if they were much more advanced than we are, then why would they be hiding? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I guess the science fiction did its job through the years, uh, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Uh, but uh, let, let yes, me ask you uh, let me ask you this uh, oh, obviously like w w everybody has that conscious about aliens extraterrestrial life and we like to throw them a little spice in there but you, you just now mentioned how many things we do not understand about even ourselves even this uh, planet uh, do you see the the the, the maybe future where uh, humanity truly moved to Mars or somewhere else, but uh, we didn't even actually uh, discover the Earth fully. Isn't that kind of <laughs> ironic? Yeah, well, I actually don't think we're going to move to Mars anytime soon uh, in, in great numbers. It's very hard. Um, so um, we will be very fortunate we, if we can support a few people living over there um, with a lot of support from Earth. Because right now we don't know how to farm, we don't know how to do all the other things, we don't know how to basically, yeah, we have ideas, but we haven't proved any of them. <laughs> so we can't even bring someone home from Mars yet. Um, the big problem there is it's hard to get off the surface of Mars. And so yeah. you need to have a rocket with a lot of chemical fuel to do that. And so uh, it's very hard to carry enough of that with you to Mars. So it's not impossible to collect fuel on Mars, but it's still difficult. So it, um, we will think it's a great accomplishment when we bring home a box of rocks from Mars with a robot. And uh, then we'll be very happy as scientists. We'll have something to analyze and study and see about the history of Mars and whether it is alive or was alive. Uh, and uh, uh, going to the next step of uh, frequent travel, well, uh, Elon Musk has a plan, and NASA has a plan. Um, they're just really hard and they take a long time, and it's pretty dangerous. Uh, if you could imagine uh, living in a, uh, in a small car uh, or a small bus for the rest of your life on the surface of Mars, uh, that's what we can offer at the moment. Uh, we cannot actually offer you a... Uh, a large garden with uh, sprinklers and sunshine on Mars. It's, uh, it's a huge engineering challenge. Uh, so not impossible, but it's really, really hard. Yeah. yeah. Elon would be pissed uh, on us right now. <laughs> and then Devere as well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm interested in terraforming Mars, but I'm also interested in terraforming Earth. I want Earth to stay habitable um, yeah. and uh, keep it... Uh, on track, um, not to warm up too much, uh, not to have the oceans rise too much. Uh, I like uh, London and Paris and all the seaside cities to still be here in another few centuries. And uh, really if we possible. allow the warming to, uh, too much, then uh, many of our great cities will disappear. Um, mm. Yeah, so that like would be a shame. Yeah. yeah, so, um, but it's, uh, you know, I think scientists and engineers have the greatest capability to make a change in that. Uh, when you ask politicians what to do, they don't know. Uh, and um, even the ones that think they do know uh, seem not to ever agree enough to make much happen. So government policy can affect uh, what the scientists and engineers do. Uh, but the big events uh, come when uh, we discover something and is possible that we didn't know about before. So, for example, we now have electric cars. We have electric airplanes. We have electric locomotives. We have all kinds of electric things that we didn't have 20 years ago. And if you ask the politicians about that, they would not have known. But if you ask engineers, some of them had the idea. They said, we're going to build you this. And uh, when it's good enough, you will buy it because it'll be better. Yeah. And so that's a path that people don't talk about enough, that uh, 
people like us are the ones who are going to solve that problem. Mm, yeah. Yeah, but uh, one of the one of the things that you mentioned before, like uh, I wouldn't like to see Earth destroyed with uh, Paris and London flooded and things like that. Actually, a book, one of my favorite books from uh, Ray Bradbury, is Chronicles of Mars. Uh, and at the end of the book, uh, when uh, we uh, humans finally destroyed Earth, uh, they're on Mars, and the the story uh, says one of the final lines. Now we are Martians. We are no more Earthlings. Now we are Martians. Because we have nothing left of us. Yeah. So it's not impossible, but I think it's very unlikely to have that particular story turn out to be true. Yeah. No, it was a true. I mean, obviously, you know, but Bradbury was just, you know, proving a yeah, point. I loved, it. I loved his stories. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking about those speculations, a lot of dust was raised when Oumuamua was noticed. It, it was the first interstellar object in our solar system. And a lot of speculations uh, were there about it. And But can you tell me what are the facts from scientific point of view that we know about Oumuamua, if I'm pronouncing it correctly? Yeah, um, what we know is that it comes through the solar system very quickly. So we calculate that it could not have originated here. It had to come from outside. Um, we uh, have a few observations about it, uh, about the shape and the, and the color. And that's about all we have. Um, so um, there's a lot of speculation about who could have made something with a shape like that and a color like that. Um, but personally, I think there's uh, no reason at all to think it was made by aliens. So we have a very complex uh, system of natural phenomena, and there's no reason to jump to the aliens before we've actually thought about it. So next time when we have one come through uh, with the web telescope, we'll be ready to watch it. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, so we right. will learn something more. Um, so. I think it's quite likely that there are aliens uh, living on planets around other stars, it's but logical, they are much, they're much too far away for, uh, for them to get here in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, so who knows? Uh, we will yeah. find out something the next time that one comes through. Yeah, <laughs> that would be exciting. And we spoke also about this new exoplanet, Toy 700D. And just a, a little bit funny question. If if life was there, if humans identical to us were there, what would they see if they looked through their version of James Webb telescope towards the Earth? So how many years into the past they would see? Would they oh. see dinosaurs, microbes, or us? <laughs> oh, good question. It depends on when you look, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so dinosaurs lived here for uh, several hundred million years. Uh, people have lived here for maybe one million years, yeah. and uh, only in the most recent years have we been doing anything that you would be able to detect from a distance. Mm -hmm. um, we started radio transmissions, and we started yeah. lasers. We, we could actually send a message to a planet all the way across the galaxy with the equipment that we have, uh, but the only way someone would be able to receive it, it would be that they know how to set up their receiving equipment. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't know how to set up the receiving equipment for transmissions someone might send to us. So, ah. so we could also, of course, we have to be extremely patient because talking to somebody on the other edge of our galaxy will take uh, uh, 50,000 years each way. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And when, with the instant gratification society that we are, that wouldn't sit well with us. <laughs> no, we need something back in a few seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I just thought of a new questions about Oumuamua. <laughs> if new evidence would be discussed, with, uh, you mentioned that James Webb would be prepared to observe when the new object, uh, new interstellar object, would enter our our galaxy. If something would be contrary to consensus, how open-minded would be astronomers, uh, astronomers society, to this new evidence of potentially having some? other thing than the comet. Oh, well, goodness. Uh, well, astronomers love to find something new and under and not and uh, surprising. So we will certainly be eager to find, get the observations. Yeah. Um, if there's uh, any reason to think that it's uh, 
not a natural thing coming through, but was created by an alien anything, then of course we'll want to talk about it. It's a lot of fun to talk about it. Um, what the, uh, uh, but of course we also have to say, well, how could you imagine uh, that a thing could be created? You can't just say it's too complicated, we can't understand it. You have to have another story that says, well, if it is what we imagine, then how could it have been made? So that's been missing in all the stories about the uh, alien um, mm -hmm. You can say, well, that's very strange, but that doesn't mean it's alien. Yeah, of course. Yeah, anom anomalies happen. <laughs> and all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and will James Webb uh, have its role in understanding black holes better? Absolutely. Um, we study them wherever we can find them. And uh, the easiest ones to find are the ones that are at the centers of, of uh, galaxies. Uh, we call them quasars because uh, um, what we see is a very bright object in the center of a galaxy. Uh, it is much too bright to be an ordinary star. Uh, and now we know that um, what is actually in there is something of, with a mass of a millions or billions of times the mass of the sun. And, and we know that because we see things orbiting around the black mm -hmm. hole in the center. And we can measure the gravity that it has. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so this is what we do. We study things that are near the black hole to see how does it act on the objects nearby. So we think that primary action is gravitational. Uh, but there are other things that the black hole has that are of great interest for, for understanding the black holes themselves. So they spin. Um, they could potentially have a charge, electric charge. Um, and from calculation, that's what we think they have, just only those few things. But a great open question, which has been worked on by Stephen Hawking and many others, is what about the information? Um, mm -hmm. When something falls into a black hole, uh, do we lose all the information about that object or is it still stored somewhere in the universe? So this very re much relates to the question of are black holes stable forever, uh, which Stephen Hawking worked on, or can they evaporate? So he said they could evaporate. Mm, yeah. uh, and that the information would eventually come back out again in some way. So this is a, a wonderful puzzle. So a big question is, where do they come from? Um, so we already know, uh, we have good evidence that a large star can collapse directly into a black hole uh, when it's old. Uh, there is at least one recorded example of a bright star that just disappeared. Mm -hmm. So yeah, right. what could it be? Um, so usually when a star gets old, it explodes. Um, yeah, in supernova. A supernova. Yeah, uh, there's, and so we think sometimes that will leave a a, a, a neutron star at the center. Uh, sometimes it will leave a black hole at the center, and sometimes it may leave nothing. So uh, that's our big question of what happens when a star gets old. Then uh, that's the one thing we know about how black holes could be made. Is there any other way? Could there be any of them left over from the Big Bang? Uh, who knows? So. Um, this relates to which came first, the galaxy or the black hole at the center of the galaxy. Mm, so yeah. uh, that is chicken topic and the egg. Yeah, so we don't know, uh, but we have a chance to find out. Yeah, and you said you observe quasars, right? And those oh, yes. are phenomena that happens after the star dies, but not, but they are rare. Am I right? Um, sorry, that. That's a supernova when a star. Oh. Yeah, yeah, but I read in one encyclopedia here that I bought that usually when star dies, it goes supernova, but there's phenomenon that it can go into quasar, if I'm right. But maybe... Well, it doesn't. A, a, a quasar actually is a, a black hole that's uh, sucking material in. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yeah. Uh, it's, so um, when a black hole forms, it may or may not have anything nearby that can fall in. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah. Um, but our, one of the questions is, can a ordinary st uh, black hole that's formed when a star dies attract enough material to itself to f that falls in and becomes as large as the as the objects we see in the centers of galaxies? Yeah. So, how would that happen? I, we don't know. That's a big question for astronomers. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and can we possibly uh, produce the new equipment, the new satellites in the near future that can go even further in the past uh, than James Webb can, even to this breaking point, uh, to Big Bang? Well, we've already done what we can. Um, mm -hmm. the, the cosmic microwave radiation is as far back as you can actually see. Um, uh -huh. So um, that's because the universe was opaque when it was hot and young. Mm -hmm. And so when you look back, look far out in space and look back in time, eventually each line of sight comes to a place in space and time where the universe was opaque. That's as far as you can see. So that's yeah. the cosmic microwave background radiation maps that we gave you with COBE and WMAP and Planck. And so that's as far as you can get, as far as we know. Um, so um, then, of course, uh, that's when the universe was 400,000 years old. Uh, then uh, as time passed after that, then uh, pretty much nothing happened that you could see uh, until the, the growth of the first stars and galaxies. So we call that the cosmic dark ages because there was nothing to see that we know of. Um, so when we get done with uh, observing with the web, we might have a new answer for you. Uh, but that's what it seems like at the moment. Yeah, great. Yeah, now, now that you, Peter, mentioned it uh, about potentially building something new, uh, I have a quote here uh, that's uh, from uh, Thomas Zurbuchen, uh, NASA's Administrator Associate for Science. And he said something interesting. Uh, you know what I'm most excited about? Uh, there's tens of thousands of scientists, and frankly, some of them just got born or are not even born. Uh, who are benefiting from this amazing telescope because it will be with us for decades. Given the impact that James Webb made, uh, what do you think w w will be its legacy when it's all said and done? And uh, with uh, Mr. Thomas, what said, uh, how much do you think will be inspiration for the future generations to go to the new frontiers? Well, right now, it's a very inspiring thing because the pictures are beautiful and the discoveries are amazing. So young people want to participate. And so they can. Um, in fact, uh, every year we ask for observing proposals. So uh, new proposals are due on January 27th this year. And so anyone anywhere in the world can send us an, an idea. So it's just been noticed that uh, using the new chat bot, the chat GPT, you can write a fairly yeah. decent outline for a proposal. Mm. So I think we're expecting to receive some of those from the chat bot, yeah, uh, uh, or at least with chat bot help. Um, but anyway, if you write a good proposal and we like it, um, we will read it. By the way, we have implemented something called dual anonymous uh, proposal reviewing. So you have to write a proposal in a way that we do not know who you are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so uh, anyone can send in a proposal. And if it's a good one, we will choose it. Um, mm -hmm. So even if the chatbot writes a good proposal, we won't necessarily know <laughs> yeah. until later. We'll find out yeah. who it was later. But, yeah. um, Scary thing. So, <laughs> this <yeah>. chat GPT. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, anyway, you were asking about the inspiration. I think we will make a greater deal of progress on these big questions. Uh, about the first galaxies that grew, uh, the first black holes that grew, uh, how stars are born, how they die, and the origins of life. So we'll make some progress, but nothing's ever finished uh, because uh, there's always a new question that comes when you answer an old question. So um, yeah. Yeah. it's going to be a very exciting time. Um, we already know um, we are three different observatories are coming online quite soon. Uh, Europe is launching the Euclid mission uh, this year, I think. Um, I like the name. Yeah, uh, and it's to observe uh, evidence of the dark matter and the dark energy. Then after that, we have the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory coming up in Chile. They're going to survey the entire sky every three nights and tell us when something changes. And uh, we expect 10 million things to change every night. So that's a lot of interesting things happening. We don't know what that will lead us to. Then um, our next NASA telescope in space after that is called the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. She was uh, head astronomer at NASA for many years. Anyway, it will be uh, a sky survey that does the near infrared search for everything strange and interesting. Uh, it will also work on the dark matter and the dark energy 
and it will have a coronagraph to look for planets around other stars. So the future is very full of things to do. Um, NASA already has a desire to follow the instructions of our National Academy Committee. <laughs> and they said, please build another telescope that's as large as the web and is capable of seeing an Earth-like planet orbiting a sun-like star. So we would then be able to search for signs of oxygen as well as water. And uh, yeah. that would be very exciting because that's a hint that there could be really life on another planet. Yeah, and what would be the first targets of the, that telescope? Would it be those uh, planets we already observed in habitable zone or something else? Um, um, I don't know, because if, if we uh, observe those planets uh, with Webb and we say, well, they don't have any atmosphere, then those would not be very good targets to, for the next mission. Yeah. Um, so I think this, the search list will be all of the nearest stars that are like the sun. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. that's, it seems yeah. like we, we already know there's one example of life. It's right here. <laughs> so, yeah. we're, we're, of course, for place, places that are similar. Yeah. And, Professor, I have to ask one more question before we wrap up. Uh, have you heard maybe about Dragan Hajdukovic? He's astrophysicist, our fellow countryman from Montenegro. He works at CERN. And he, 10 years ago, I believe, he gave an interesting alternative theory to the expansion of the universe about bipolarity of uh, gravitation, where he, where he says that uh, dark matter is illusion and stuff like that. And they are currently testing it in the in the CERN, if I'm correct. Oh, you heard well, that? I'm not up to date with his work. I can't really give you a technical answer. Uh, I know uh, many astronomers would like to find an alternative to uh, dark matter and dark energy because neither of them was predicted by any fundamental theory. So um, since we didn't expect it, well, they are a surprise. And so um, maybe they're not what they seem. Uh, on the other hand, so far, um, there's no strong evidence against the dark matter or the dark energy either. So mm -hmm. it's just an exciting time to be alive. Yeah, definitely. Especially for astronomers. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you for this opportunity to explore the depths of space from our uh, rooms. Yeah. And before we wrap up, we have a little tradition where we... Uh, say the quote or verse or something uh, else on our language and translate it on English. And I have prepared the quote. Sometimes artists can give us fine thoughts about the uh, universe. And we have this artist, Voya Stanić, here in Montenegro. And he said on our language, Ovaj svijet i sve što postoji ne bi imalo nikakav smisao da nema ljudi. Sve ljepote prirode i raskošne pojave i događaje koji nas okružuju bili bi besmisleni ako ne bi postojao neko razuman da ih vidi. Središte svemira je čovjek, van ljudi, to je samo jedan crni, gluvonjem i prazan prostor koji, kroz koji tumaraju izgubljeni, usijani i ohlađeni grumeni koji osvjetljava samo naš pogled. Osvajanje svemira, putovanje u svemir, svemirski brodovi, to je jedna no, naivna iluzija. Da li smo više u svemiru ako se nalazimo u svemirskom brodu ili na nekoj drugoj planeti, nego što smo sad? Zemlja je također svemirski brod i to za nas najudobnije što se može zamisliti. Svemir potiče odmah pored mog prozora. I know it's a little bit long, but it's worth it. And on English it would be, this world and everything that exists would have no meaning if there were no people. All the beauties of nature and the magnificent phenomena and events that, surrounds, uh, that surround us would be meaningless if there was no sane person to see them. The center of the universe is man. Outside of people, it's just black, mute and empty space through which wander lost, heated and cooled nuggets illuminated only by our gaze. Space conquest, space travel, spaceships. That's a naive illusion. Are we more in space if we are in a spaceship or on another planet than we are now? Earth is also a spaceship. And for us, it is the most comfortable that can be imagined. The universe falls right by my window. That's the quote. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Lovely quote. And thank you for this lovely interview. We stay genuine, uncensored and unscripted, and we always will, as we have to order our usual. Share us, subscribe us, and stay tuned until the next Wednesday. Iguzo!